Good evening and welcome. Bethel is an inclusive faith community seeking to transform lives by exemplifying the unconditional love of Jesus. We extend a cordial and heartfelt welcome to all who join us in worship today in person, via Zoom, or live stream. Welcome to those new to the Christian faith, those who are longtime followers of Christ, as well as those who are just curious about faith in Christ. To our friends who are without a church home and to those visiting with friends and family from another faith community. To those who need strength, want to follow Jesus Christ, have doubts or do not yet believe. To people of every color, culture, sexual orientation, gender identification, economic background, age, size, ability and challenges. Old friends and new guests. To the old and the young, believers and questioners and questioning believers. We welcome you to worship God with us on this day. Good evening, and just by way of announcements, I'd like to uh, thank James uh, for being here with us today. I'll introduce him a little bit later, but I'd like to thank James and his mom, Carol, is here with us as well. So thank you for coming. And we have been doing a theme on our fifth Sundays. The first one was on uh, reconciliation, and this one is on recovery. In the life of the church, today is actually Reformation Sunday. So we have this R theme going. Maybe next time we'll do something related to the R. We want to thank Emily for putting our program together for today. And we want to thank all of those that are helping. I think, Christy, you're helping in the kitchen with the food. And maybe, I don't know who else is helping with the food. But we just want to thank you for coming out and um, being on this journey with us today. And may the peace of our Lord be with each and every one of you. I don't want to have too high and mighty. Tomorrow I may fall down on my face. So Lord, I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy. And I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Sunshine, I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy, and I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Sometimes life is good when the trouble comes my way. But whatever happens, Lord, I thank you for this day. When I'm feeling troubled, I lift my hands and pray that your will be done in the rain or sun. Oh, it's a beautiful day. Lord, I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy and I thank you for pain. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. I give thanks when I'm feeling glad. I give thanks in the morning and thanks in the evening and thanks when I'm feeling sad. I thank you for sunshine. I thank you for rain. I thank you for joy and I thank you for pain. Take my name, 
Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no break gonna hold my body down. There ain't no trumpet sound love is my weapon i'm gonna take my giants down there ain't no grave gonna hold my body down there ain't no grave gonna hold my body down when i hear that trumpet sound And he went on down to hell And he took back every key He rose up as a lion And set all captives free There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body now There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body now to invite Ron up. Are you all having a nice evening tonight? It's good, good. It's nice to be able to be together, even though there's a lot of trouble in the world. It's nice that we can be here together. What the mercy of God can do If you knew me then You believe me now God turned my whole life upside down To the old and he made it new That's just what the mercy of God can do now I'm alive to tell the story how I overcome it's his goodness and mercy and the power of his blood I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done it's a good 
I've known James for, well, we won't say how many years. We've known each other since we were 14 years old. There are very few friends that we have in our life that have traveled with us that long. And um, he knows all the dirt on me, but I've already paid him not to say anything. <laughs> uh, we played on the tennis team together at Dorsey High School, and then he went off to USC, and I went to Loyola. And um, I would go over his house and visit him and his mom and his sister. And he'll say that he won the matches against me, but I'm your pastor, so believe me. <laughs> Someone has said that a good friend is God's way of apologizing for your family. <laughs> James doesn't replace any of my siblings, but he just adds to my family as a brother that brother from another mother. And I love him like a brother. 
I had the honor of officiating his uh, wedding several, many years ago, and our friendship has continued over the 40 plus years. Thank you for sharing your story with us, James. Let's give him a welcome as he comes. Hello, I would like to say welcome to the Bethel Luther Church community. It's so nice to be here. It's nice to see the people who are alive. It's nice to see real people because that's where I usually come when I have a meeting. And I'm talking about compulsive gambling and alcoholism. But the key is I like seeing your smiles. I like hearing you um, sing. And the song Mercy just before I came on was just right on, run, right on time. Because that's what I want to share with you, a story of mercy. And continuing, I want to say that I am very happy that the, I was invited here. And I want to give permission to record this testimony. OK, first of all, I'll just start off with a little honesty. Yes, I used to beat tennis, um, Kenneth, Pastor Kenneth, <laughs> Katie, um, in tennis all the time. What? <laughs> he would win the first set 6-0, um, and then I'll come back and win the next set, and then we have to go to a 7-6 tiebreaker in the third set <laughs> because I refused to give up. <laughs> but it, it didn't matter who won. It's just as long as we went three sets and the last set was 6-6, six, six and we had to go to a tiebreaker. <laughs> That's all I wanted. Well, let's start off with a little honesty. Um, 24 years ago, I was at my wit's end, and I, I was a compulsive gambler and an alcoholic. Where did it start? When I was young, when I knew Kenneth. When I was 14, I used to um, handicap the horses daily from the daily racing forums and give my sheets to my father every morning. And so it, it started off as something that was not harmful. You know, but over time, let's fast forward um, 21 years, I had progressed to being compulsively addicted to gambling on a daily basis. And also I had picked up drinking also, because I, I used to be the bartender at my mom and dad's parties, and I would make everybody's drink too strong. And then I would have to collect all the drinks up, and I would drink the leftovers. And I just, you know, I didn't see any harm in that because I liked the effect. But what I found when I had to change is um, I didn't know how to change. And so where it started was with honesty. Being honest to myself that something needed to change, period. So what did I do? I, I went to a counselor. I went to a chemical dependency recovery program. And then I also went to a 12-step program. Uh, it took a while. Uh, I went to gambling first because I knew that was a problem. But it only took 27 additional days of not gambling that I realized I had to stop drinking. And so I have two sobriety dates. One is March 5th, 1999 for gambling and April Fool's Day, 1999. <laughs> so every April Fool's Day, I celebrate and say, can you believe James has not had a drink? Because that is the biggest April Fool's. <laughs> but going on, honesty. The honesty started when I decided to change. It was very difficult because when I saw the 12-step program, it said you had to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. And at that point, I felt that I had been abandoned. But that's just how I felt at that time. What I realized as time progressed I didn't have to believe that the program would work because I didn't agree with all 12 of the steps. But there were parts of them I, I said, well, I might as well try. And the thing that I found was um, the guy that ended up being my sponsor, he told me, you don't have to believe. You just have to be willing. And, and that was the most important part of my recovery, the willingness to do something different. He said, when you, your feelings come up and you think you should go this direction, I need you to go the other direction, 180 degrees. Do the complete opposite. And in some cases, do not do anything at all. <laughs> Defer a decision. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> that was 
very, that took a lot of open-mindedness because I had to open my mind to another way of thinking. And then I had to realize that the compulsion to drink and gamble was not going away, that I would have to deal with it on a daily basis and have to stop daily. You know, I don't think about tomorrow. I don't think about yesterday. I just think about right now. And what I've learned is over time is by being honest with my sponsor, being open minded and willing to take his direction. That in the 12 steps, the 12th step is to go back and help somebody else. But that's where I learned the most being in fellowship in the group. I would sit across from a stranger, give them the same instructions my sponsor gave me, and I would see myself. And I had never met this person. They would share something. And I would say, wow, God has a sense of humor. He placed someone in front of me who is just like me, who I have never met. And their backgrounds, I would have never thought we were alike. And but I found that we are alike. We're all human. And um, I'm very grateful for both of my sponsors in both programs. They both had different approaches, but I learned from both. And I carried it forward to countless number of people over the past 24 years. And I've seen miracles in people. You know, I don't need a fantastic miracle like, you know, it rained and then it stopped and then it poured and then everything cleared up. I don't need that. I just need a person sitting in front of me uh, be willing to take direction and I can watch the miracle in their life. And all I did was share my life with them. And I never knew that drinking and gambling would be such a significant purpose in my life. By participating in these programs, I've been able to help others on a voluntary basis. And it helped me stop gambling and drinking. Because if I have a story to tell and I can share it with another human being, I, I can abstain from gambling and drinking even if it pops in my head. So it's still, it's still there. You know, I would love to say, oh, double down on 13, playing blackjack. <laughs> you, know? You, know, you know, I would have six, seven, and I said an eight is coming. <laughs> you know, so, and um, as far as drinking, I don't miss that at all. Um, my grandmother told me when I started drinking when I was 14, she told me, James, you really don't need that. And when I told her I got sober when I was 35, she said, I told you you didn't need that. You are already there. And I can tell you, like I'm looking at you right now, I'm still there. I don't need any inputs from outside things. And I can be very joyous and, and free and peaceful. What would I say to the members of the church? Look for outside sources to help you and your own community. Because there, are, you never know who's sitting next to you. There may be a wonderful resource just sitting there and all you have to do is ask for help. And I'm glad that I did. And I just wanna say, I am so happy to be sober. I am so happy not to be gambling. And it didn't help happen without the trust in God. But I didn't believe at first, it, I was only willing. And I just want to say that's how it worked. And so I'm open for any questions from the community, if you have any. I'll start with you. Okay. They often say that persons with um, addictions have to hit rock bottom. How would you describe your rock bottom? Uh, my rock bottom, um, what it was, um, my house was in foreclosure. I had the money to get it out of foreclosure, but I needed some money extra. I needed some money <laughs> after I wanted to pay them. I wanted something extra and I went and lost all of that money. I went to my grandparents. They gave me the money again, but they gave me a check written out to me. And then I lost that money. And that was the bottom. Because now I had to create another story. I like to call my lies stories. <laughs> because because my lies, I had to believe them in order to continue. 
And so I made up something and I told my grandfather, well, granddad, and I, I didn't tell him what I did. I just told him that they needed another additional monies, but I needed a, a cashier's check this time. <laughs> and because at that point, my mortgage did not take anything but cash or cashier's checks from me. They didn't take any other type of instruments. And um, that was okay with me, but he agreed. But many years later, when I had, I had to make amends to my grandparents, and I just told them that due to my gambling, that's why I was so short of money. But that was some time later. But my sponsor told me I don't have to tell details. Just don't take those actions further on. And so I never had to ask my grandparents for anything else at that time. And when I got a car shortly after, he said, dang, James got a car and he didn't ask me for anything. That was what my granddad said. But he always knew something was wrong with my gambling. He said to me once in Vegas, he said, you know, that's not, that's my give me granddad grandson. He told Telly Savalas that he was sitting at the, the poker table with my granddad. And he said, he gambles kind of peculiar. And I thought about it later and I said, yeah, he identified what was wrong at a very early age. And I just want to say, um, I'm still happy for all the experiences because I wouldn't change a thing because it keeps me open minded and willing to help others. Next question. Thanks for, for joining our congregation and speaking with us today. Um, I was wondering what was the most difficult step in your 12 step programs and was it different from your gambling program uh, versus your alcoholics? Okay, so uh, the most difficult step was the inventories because when I did the gambling inventory first. That was pretty simple. The emotions that came up, you know, I talked about handicapping the horses like I shared earlier for my father when I was like 13, 14 years old, just giving them a sheet on a daily basis. That was easy. But um, there were parts of my recovery that was different in alcohol, in, in alcoholism, that even though I wrote about the same time period, there were other issues that weren't written about when I did the gambling story. Because I thought about things that weren't associated with gambling, but they were happening at, at the same time. And I didn't know that I had those feelings and resentments toward other people based on alcohol. So the, the resentments and anger and the fear and the, um, the experiences were totally different, even though they were in the same time period. They all coexisted at the same time. But when I wrote them out, it was um, very, um, it was nice to have both programs because I saw two, two, different, two different stories for me based on what it was about. Even though it was the same time period, they all were coincided together. But what happened the most was making amends. That was the easiest part because I was so honest in the fourth step for both of them that it was clear who I had to make amends to. And the most important amends I made was were living amends to not repeat those actions to that person ever again. And I think that will make that was the difficulty. And then also acceptance of people who didn't want to accept your amends. You have to accept that too. Because when you make amends, it's not an apology. It's better treatment from here on out. <clears throat> and um, some of the people on those lists don't see it your way. <laughs> and I think that was the most difficult thing. And the thing I do is I pray for them and I keep treating them fairly, even if I do have to interact with them. Okay, next question. Oh. <clears throat> Hello, how are you? 
I'm good. Um, yeah, I'm going through honesty. I'm seeing today um, is the most important thing. But there's the world outside. I don't really. First of all, I need more than what the world has out there. And it's got a pull pulling on me that doesn't want me to be honest. And um, I don't know if I want to be honest out there. So I'm practicing on being honest every day, but there's a part of me that doesn't want to be honest, that wants to reject the truth, wants to be in denial. And I think I'm, it's a defense mechanism against what I'm up against out there. And um, I do, I need God, then I just can't seem to find God out there when you come into places like this. So. Yes, thank you for having me here at your place. It's a wonderful place. Thank you. Okay, and I just want to add one more thing. Um, honesty with your sponsor is most important, but honesty about things that will harm yourself or others in your family is not what we do. Because except you, you, you don't do that, except to do so when it would harm yourself or others. But sharing that with a sponsor is not going to harm yourself or others because he's trying to give you a path to make amends for those actions. So I don't say go out there and be honest about everything with everybody. You know, you select from your direction what to do with the others, because what you do is you take the instructions you've been given to treat them differently. And they don't need to know all of your secrets. Is there anyone in Zoom who would like to ask a question? Hi, my name Hello, is- Hello, Steph. I can't Hi. hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. Okay, um, James, thank you so much for just sharing your experience, strength and hope, and you know, modeling honesty for us as well too, and being what I like to call vulnerageous. And um, I've had a lot of people in my life who have been, um, who've suffered from addiction and I am in the other companion program, Al-Anon for 22 years and realized that as a family, dis -E, it, it, you know, it aff affected me every bit as much as my loved ones. And one of the things I would love to hear from you would be um, what your relationship was like with God before you entered um, recovery and having experienced recovery, what's your relationship with God today? Good question. And I, I am too, I'm also a codependent also. So not only am I a, a gambler and um, a drinker, I'm also codependent. I like to care for others and try to tell them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I found I have no power over that either. But um, to tell um, my relationship with God, I, I'm Christian, I was baptized, I grew up as a Christian belief. Um, it was more like, a, you know, faith-based, whereas if you do the right thing, you should be rewarded. That's how I believed. And um, I, didn't, I didn't like the consequences of some of my decisions. And so I thought God had abandoned me because it kept getting worse and worse. But after going through the 12 step program, I realized he had to keep turning up the volume for me to listen. For me to change, the volume had to go up very, very high. He couldn't do it nicely, you know. I have a friend say, oh, James, I think you have a problem. <laughs> I said, I don't have no problem. I don't have hangovers. I go to work all the time. You know, I excel, I, I'm doing well in my career, but those aren't the important things. It's relationships. And what happened was that the volume got so high, the disappointments got so high, the emotions and feelings got so high that I had to change. And my belief in God and miracles went tenfold when I went to the 12-step program because I met others who were like me. 
And I knew at that point why I had to go to a 12 step program. I had to meet other people who had had my experience because I couldn't meet them at first in the churches that I attended because I just thought I was sinful and I was going to hell. That was the God that I started with before recovery. But now, but after it, my sponsor asked me something. <clears throat> he said, if you had, a, had an opportunity to, to give God the qualities you need in your recovery, what would they be? I said, he would have to be clever. He would have to be able to talk to me through others. He would have to be understanding. He would have to tolerate my stubbornness. And, and also he had to be forgiving. But those were the qualities I wanted from God at that time. And I can say after 24 plus years, everything I wrote down on that piece of paper, he did it. Amen. <laughs> you know, he met me where I was. He didn't um, try to meet me where I should be to, in some ideal situation. He met me where I was. And that's the difference between my God prior to the 12 step program and my God before. My God before was punishing and I wasn't gonna meet the bar. So that even though it said it was, he had forgiveness and all that, and, but I had put myself in such a state, I said, well, he won't forgive me. But that wasn't true. He just had to help me through a different venue. And I just wanna say I attended five to 10 meetings a week for my fir fi first five years of recovery. And I went to every denomination church that would allow us to have meetings. So I just wanna say I never, um, you know, when say people say, well, where's your church home? I said, my church home is in recovery. And I attend meetings in all denominations of churches. And I've learned a lot from different religious people that I've met throughout these years. And I've embraced their practices that would help me not drink and gamble. Because you never know who you're gonna meet when you're in a 12 step room and what they practice. And, um, and that's the difference between my God when I, before I stopped gambling and drinking and my God now. I hope that was clear. One more? I have a wondering. Um, it seems to me that we all have these different parts and facets of ourselves. And then uh, some of the things we do, whether it's drinking or another thing, they seem like ways to manage things that are down deeper inside. And I'm not asking what yours were, but I'm wondering, what do you think about that, that, that the drinking or the gambling in your case or whatever it might be that each of us is doing, that it's really just there, it means well, um, even though it's not serving us well, but that there's something still underneath that needs some attention? Yes, um, I can tell you my father died when I was 18 and I didn't get sober until I was 35 and I had done the steps twice by the time I was 38 and I realized at 38 on the anniversary of his death, I had been grieving from 18 to 38 and since I used to handicap those horses for him on a daily basis, that just kept feeding my participation in gambling but it was based on my grief of his loss. But I didn't realize that until I was sober for three years. And, um, and I stopped grieving 38, at 38, and I'm, I'll be 60 next week, a week from today. So I would say, yes, it's an internal job. And that's what the um, 12 steps allow you to process. And that's where the honesty comes in. Because whatever you leave out, um, during the process, because you don't do it once, you do it many times. You do it your first time, then you might have another addiction, then you do it again, and then you sponsor people. And guess what happens? The person sitting in front of you is just like you and is having the same problem that your, pro your sponsor told you how to solve. And I said, I thought I can not do this, but I guess I have to do this with my sponsee. And then I just want to share the success of your sponsee is not the goal. The goal is to save yourself. It's just that I've had a lot of wonderful people who ended, who started off as sponsees, who ended up close friends.
to this day. And, but that doesn't have to be the case because I can sponsor someone and take them through and that doesn't have to happen. But the key is I, I reached out, helped them. And then if I see anything that they deep inside that they need additional help with, like you suggested, I guide them to that or encourage them to do that and share what I did. So, all right, how much? James, I have a question. I yes, a question. go ahead. Uh, I read an article several years ago about lessons that the church can learn from AA. If you were to write an article like that, what would you say in that article? Embrace everyone who walk, walks through the door. Have 12 step meetings in your church at a low cost, but make sure that it's not free. Make sure the members uh, are self supporting through their own contributions. Because if they're willing to show up, make the coffee, put money in there to maintain the room, the meeting room, that means they're committed to, to recovery. And that's what I would say because um, I've always went, when I went to church as a young man, I always thought um, that God was a condemning God and he was going to throw me to brimstone and, you know, and fire. But that's not the case. I know he's forgiving and loving. And I would say to the church, embrace everyone who comes in. There's many, um, there's mental factors. There's mental illness. You know, a lot of people might have a combination of all three, you know, addiction and mental illness. But what you do is you stop one so the others can be identified. Like in my case, I stopped gambling first. And in 27 days, I knew I was an alcoholic because I went to a new bar after every meeting I went to for 27 days. <laughs> and ended up at the casino. You know, and and uh, I called my friend was there and he said, where have you been? I said, I've been at meetings and I want to get my 30 day, 30 day coin. He said, well, you're going to watch me tonight. And I did. And I didn't gamble that night because of him. That why did I believe him? Because he was a fellow gambler just like me. And he told me that on many occasions. And so uh, I saw him 13 years later in Del Taco. I was in the drive through. And I had to go tell him, I said, you know, you saved me that night. You know, I didn't gamble that night and I had many years of sobriety by that time. And I just wanted to say thank you. And, I, and that's how it works. You never know who's there. And I would say to the church home, embrace your fellows, do your best to guide them to outside resources. And then also invite them to be in fellowship with you and just pray for them. That's what I would say. Go ahead. To not believe. Um, I never offended everybody. I was able to be really polite and courteous. Uh, now the honest, the honest I can get is uh, believing in Jesus. And out there in the world, I am always am offending people. So now, honestly, that I believe in Jesus, I'm offending people all the time. They're getting very upset um, if I say the name, and um, they can react, be very rude to me, and um, very displeased and not happy with me if I say the name. And the honest, my, the God's honest truth is I believe in Jesus, but it's safe to say it in here. But out there in the real world, I keep running into this problem. Any ideas what's going on or what I should, how I should feel? Well, how we handle it in the 12 step program, we use higher power and let that be enough because you have to look at the venue you're speaking at and use the language that's comfortable for your venue. And that's how we do it because you, you can fellowship with your fellow Christians and you can speak it out loud, but in some venues you have to edit yourself. And that's what I would advise. Well, and that's what I've learned to do. I'll put it that way. That's what I practice. All right, thank you all.
meets us where we are at. Amen? Amen. And sends an army out to whisper in our ears with patience and to rescue us. So we're grateful to have Dee Dee saying, I will rescue. And Ron will be joining us again. Thank you, Ron. While we're, while we're waiting, uh, just I'll add to that last comment that was made in regard to saying the name Jesus in public and you know speaking out about what your beliefs are and what uh, you know what you are to someone else. Um, I had someone make a comment at my job, my workplace, is that um, he said, "Hey, Shane, I, I know I know you're a believer and I know you believe in Jesus, but." I've never really heard you say that at work. You just kind of show it. And, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, exactly all about you, but you always smile. You always help. You always go out of your way to do something for others. You always show love. And I think that's one of the biggest things that can overcome or can supersede just saying the name if you can live it out in your life and the things that you do as well. So just Amen. want to add that piece. Amen. Amen. You are not hidden. There's never been a moment you were forgotten, you are not hopeless. Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night is true. I will rescue you. There is no distance that cannot be covered over and over. I, you're not I'll be your shelter, I'll be your armor. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your
I've been waiting for breakthrough I've been praying for change I know you'll work it out for good But how long will it take? And I've been asking for healing And I'm not gonna lie I'm ready for the miracle God let it be this time But if I never see the promise On this side of the grave my hope might be shaken, but my faith will never break. Because I know the day is coming, you're right on all the wrong. So I'll praise you in the waiting, my faith will stay strong. Ooh, oh, God, you taught me to trust you. You show me how to believe. The author of the finisher of what you started me. So I'm not gonna doubt it. I'm gonna hold on to peace. Cause if I have you and nothing else, I still have everything. Cause I never see the promise on this side of the grave. My hope might be shaken, my faith will never break. Because I know the day. Shaken, but my faith will never break. Cause I know the day is coming when you'll right all of the wrong. So I'll praise you in the waiting, and my faith will stay strong. So several Several months ago, uh, with support from the leadership of this church, we made a decision to no longer use wine when we serve communion out of respect for those who might be challenged with some of the addiction. So our communion is being served with grape juice. And for me, communion is really a love letter from Jesus to you and me, saying that he loves us this much. So I invite you to come and read the letter today as you partake of communion. These are the gifts of God for you, the children of God. I invite you to come. Those who are served, worshiping with us uh, via Zoom, this is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you.
I just want to remind you that there's more food than this available after service. <laughs> and we want, you, we want you to join us and eat some of it, okay? So please, as you exit today, go that way into the, the fellowship hall and join us for an extended fellowship and meal. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, God, because he is a chain breaker. And now we're going to sing a couple songs about what a great chain breaker and, li and li living in freedom that God can give us. the same old lies and if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life have you got pain Jesus is a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way maker if you need freedom a saving he's a prison shaking savior Chains. He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know that just ain't right. When there's a better life. There's a better life If you got pain Jesus is a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom A saving He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains He's a chain breaker Somebody testify. Testify. You believe it. If you receive it. You can feel it. Somebody testify. Testify. If you can feel it. You believe it. You receive it. If you can feel it. Somebody testify. Testify. If you believe it. Somebody testify. If you got pain, Jesus is a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, Chain Amen. Amen. One last song with Ron, Walking Free. And I want to hear you all feel it. Maybe you can stand up and get some of those wiggles out on this last one. Yeah, let's get it, let's get it moving. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Ron. was guilty case closed the no chance for me to ever leave this prison of my sin now I know it might sound crazy but one day I can't lock that cell I heard a small voice say your debt's been paid by somebody else that's why I'm walking 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 free no more darkness guilt has